This is StoryBeat, storytellers on storytelling. An exploration into how master storytellers and artists develop and build brilliant stories and works of art that people everywhere love and admire. So join us as we discover how talented creators of all kinds find success in the worlds of imagination and entertainment. Here now is your host, Steve Cuden. Thanks for joining us on StoryBeat. If you like this podcast, please take a moment to give us a rating or review on whatever app or platform you're listening to. Your support helps us bring more great StoryBeat episodes to you. Well, we have a really special show today. My guests are three divine talents who've come together to create a magnificent song tribute to those on the medical front lines of the COVID-19 pandemic. Songwriters Michelle Browerman and Hilary Rollins joined forces with the angelic-voiced singer Maud Maggart to produce the gorgeous song While There Is Still Time, which will be the focus of today's story beat. Composer Michelle Browerman, who's one of my most memorable story beat guests, has enjoyed a wide-ranging career in music. Her song, My Favorite Year, co-written with Karen Gottlieb, has become a cabaret standard. Her music for the theater includes The Bell of Tombstone with Sheila Ray, Dangerous Beauty with Amanda McBroom, and the 2019 Ovation Award-winning Bronco Billy with Chip Rosenblum and John Torres. She's been musical director for Amanda McBroom, Anne Hampton Calloway, Dixie Carter, Heather McRae, Wendy Lane Bailey, Donna McKechnie, and more. Hilary Rollins is an award-winning lyricist, librettist, playwright, TV writer, and essayist. In addition to writing, she's a performer and producer of live music and theater events in intimate venues in Los Angeles and New York through her company, Hillary Rollins Presents. Since her cabaret debut in 2001, singer Maud Maggart has performed in cabarets and theaters across the United States and Europe. Her performances have included her yearly engagement at the Oak Room of the Algonquin Hotel, the Oregon Festival of American Music, Michael Feinstein's concert series at Carnegie Hall, and the national live radio broadcast of A Prairie Home Companion. Maud has recorded songs with such talents as Ray Jessel, John Lithgow, David Lucky, Molly Ryan, Brent Spiner, and her sister, Fiona Apple, with whom she is currently recording a new project. Maud has five solo albums to her credit, the latest of which, Here Come the Dreamers, will be available this summer. That would be 2020. She can be seen in the TCM documentary, Johnny Mercer, The Dreams on Me, and on the PBS series, The American Songbook. At the end of today's show, stick around to hear their beautiful song, While There Is Still Time. A link to a video of the song created by folk legend Christine Lavin will also be on storybeat.com. Listeners are encouraged to donate to directrelief.org, which is a humanitarian aid organization active in all 50 states and more than 80 countries with a mission to improve the health and lives of people affected by poverty or emergencies without regard to politics, religion, or the ability to pay. Direct Relief is currently focused on getting protective gear and critical care medications to as many health workers as possible, as quickly as possible. So for all of those amazing reasons, I'm beyond thrilled to welcome the exceptionally gifted Michelle Browerman, Hillary Rollins, and Maude Maggart to Story Beat today. Welcome to you all. Thank you. It's so glad to have you on the show. So first of all, I'm really glad to see that you're all well and you know not in trouble on a health basis and that you're being somehow creatively productive because I know some people are and some aren't during this pandemic. I'm curious about how being sheltered in place has impacted your creativity and productivity in general, just in general. Maud, um, how's it impacting you? Are you still able to sing every day? Sure, I sing every day, but I have to say that when this song came along, that really, uh, it really shined a light in my life because I, I wasn't, you know, being productive musically all that much, except for making up little songs to my daughter or, you know, just singing around the house. But mm -hmm. this was... Um, uh, a really a beautiful sense of purpose that this song gave me. And it was fun. <laughs> <Okay>. H <laughs> Hillary, how how's this impacted you? You know, it's interesting. I, I keep saying a, a quote that I'm often using <laughs> in my life, which is, you know, the Dickens, it's the best of times, it's the worst oh, of times. Oh, indeed. And, you know, I find that to be true. 
just spiritually true in everything, it, it's, it's true writ large right now. So in some ways, it's been the greatest gift to creative people, or to me anyway, as a creative person, because, you know, the excuses of, gotta run to the gym, that ain't happening. You know, it's, it's like all the time that I've complained about not having time to write, is now I have time to write. I also have experienced the difficulty with having unscheduled time to write <laughs> and facing the demons that are, you know, there's no one stopping me but me. So I've been very, very productive in some areas creatively and in others very scattered and, and you know, frustrated. And I, it's not all that different than how it was before the pandemic. It's just turned up several notches. Well, there's, a, there, there's an <laughs> element of anxiety in it for most people. I know it is for me. Um, and that that anxiety has a tendency to impact the way you're thinking, at least it does in, in my world. And I've spoken to any number of artists who say the same thing. Michelle, how's, how's this impacted you? I know you've been busy, but how's it? Impacted yeah, you? It, it's, it's the oddest thing. I mean, right before we started sheltering in place, I was in New York getting an award, Bistro Award, and um, being spending time with friends and going to the theater. And then I, I came home on an empty plane and just went, wait a minute, this, this is more real than I wanted to see. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Um, but since I've been home, Partially, I, I've been, I'm still working. I'm working on an animation project with Amanda for, you know, we're writing songs for like a series of animation projects for kids. So I've had work and deadlines and songs t to get rejected. <laughs> and, um, so, so it seems to me, I, you know, I thought I was going to come home and take out my knitting needles. That is just so not happening. Yeah. I, am, I, I am baking sourdough bread, and I had no idea that I was absolutely on trend with that. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it feels like an oddly productive time, and, and that word, gift, keeps coming up. I'm very aware of what's going on around me. I'm very aware that there's this strange, subtle, scary, dangerous thing happening and i'm terribly aware of how many people are being hurt right now economically as well as health wise well sure but in my cocoon here life is wonderful well that's that's encouraging to hear because like i say some people are struggling with this and you're it's good to know that some of us are not <laughs> you're not mm -hmm. struggling with it uh, um all right so let's we're here to talk about the song while there is still time where did this come from? Where did the beginning of the song come from? How did it begin? Well, I guess, yeah, I'll take that because I, I, it came from me originally. And right, it this came is Hillary, from me. good. Yes, good, good. sorry, Hillary here. So um, I was, it's funny, I, I, my, my, my secondary passion, aside from writing and art, music and all of that, is medicine it's not there's no real explanation for it it's just something that's always been interesting to me and I always said I would have been a doctor if I could have done math you know and I was from that period of girls don't do math <laughs> they certainly didn't teach it well where I was so I just I couldn't you know I couldn't um compete in that arena but I always stayed interested in psychology and medicine and bi human biology and that kind of thing so in addition to all the stuff that I do for my writing in research, I have this little secret thing that I subscribe to something called Medscape, which is uh, really for doctors. Um, but it's a it's an online publication about medicine and health and science. And it's not totally, it's not news, it's not partisan in any way, it's just medical stuff. And while, um, and most of it is beyond me, most of it I read and I go, I have no idea what they're talking about. But every so often there's something that I can sort of wrap my brain around. And there was an interesting video during the COVID-19 crisis where some, during this crisis, and some doctor was talking about some aspect of it on video. And at the end of the video, he said something that really struck me. Um, and he, he said, I want to quote the lines of the poet Philip Larkin, who's a famous British uh, right, poet. Sure. And he said, he said, we need to be kind while there is still time. And of course, as a lyricist, 
immediately I heard the rhythm of that, I heard the rhyme of that, and I was just struck by the simplicity and the truth of it, and that it came from a poet and was being quoted to me by a doctor. And I thought, well, this is, this is beshert, as we say in, in Yiddish, this yes. is meant to be. Um, and I just went and looked up the poem, and I didn't know much about, I mean, I know his famous poem, you know, they fuck you up, your mom and dad. Um, but <laughs> I really didn't know the rest of his, his work. And this was a gorgeous, brief, beautiful poem called The Mower. And it totally spoke to me and it spoke to the moment. It was the perfect combination of all these factors. So I took those two lines and I didn't want to, you know, you'll hear in the lyric, I, I refer to the poet. I say a poet of sorrow. Because I true. didn't want to own those lines for myself. Those, those were given to me by him and uh, spoke to me and i so thought those are your op that's your opening line no that's actually the, yeah that is the opening line but i use the, the lines from the poem as the last two lines of the song and it, it it's the most un uh i didn't work very hard it flowed out of me it was it was inspiration it just so how, long, how long did it take you to write the lyrics i can't even say probably in one sitting so, so less than less than a few hours then. Yes, I mean there were tweaks, there were some changes. Once I got Michelle on board to do the music, we made some improvements, and you know, as one does. But um, the song had a shape and a and a. It, it was just one of those things that happens where you go, well, that's divine inspiration. The rest of the time, it's work. Yes, of course. Uh, you know, when it comes, it comes. When it flows, it flows. It's an amazing thing. Um, I, all writers experience that where it, nothing comes and then yes, everything comes at one time. So yeah, it's a, it's a really cool thing when that does happen. So then how did you get it to Michelle? How did that come to be? Well, Michelle and I have worked together before and we're, we're friends and we wrote a song, oddly enough, the other song that we've written together was also inspired by a poem. Um, and I became, I've sort of, as a side project, I've gotten really interested in poems that inspire lyrics, inspire songs, but are not settings of poems. So, you know, where, as a lyricist, I go somewhere else completely with it, but I'm, I'm, I'm sort of um, triggered by a poem. And so I'd done that once with a close friend's poem, a beautiful poem, and it was, we were very happy with the song that came out of that. So we were talking and I mentioned that I had just written a new lyric. And she said, send it to me right away. So I did. And I was thrilled because, you know, she's the best. Well, th that we know. That and she's the best for this. You know, I and, knew that she understood my sensibility. And, and, and you know what? The proof of that's in the pudding, right? Yeah. yeah. You, know, you could say that all day long, but unless the evidence of it is there later, forget it. But the evidence is clearly there. Um, how, I, I'm just curious how this then, and we'll get into the details of this in a moment, but how this all wound up being dedicated to directrelief.org. How did that happen? I'll take it from there uh, for that part. Um, I, this is Michelle. All, yeah, this is Michelle. And um, I, Hillary had mentioned that she thought that the music should be Dylan-esque. Dylan which I, I was in Bob Dylan's band for two weeks, many, many years ago, oh, decades no. ago. So you I have, just, you have some really good Bob Dylan stories. I know I've heard them. I know you have, and I do. Yeah, we, we, we've told each other our kiss-off stories. <laughs> um, but so I, I mean, and again, the music came very quickly too. And I, you know, so I sent Hillary an MP3 and said, here's, here's where I am right now. Let's talk about it. And as soon as we were talking about the song, I said, we should tie this to a charity. Um, and my son, his band had just done a fundraiser a week or two earlier for direct relief. And I've um, donated to them. Actually, I, I am an ongoing donor to them because they jumped in after we had the wildfires here a few years ago. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Just were on the spot and effective, present and helpful. And I just thought, I like, I like organizations like that, you know, who do something when you need them. They're there when you need them. So I, I suggested that and we looked them up online, you know, and checked them out on Charity Navigator and all that and just went, yeah, let's do this. So, so then you, you then contacted them or did, did you just no, put it up that we, way? We tried to contact them and, and we're hoping to speak with somebody from their organization, honestly, later today. Wow. But um, they're very busy right now. They're, ah. they're not necessarily looking at emails from songwriters saying, hi, I wrote a song we think you might want to use. You know? 
So we just did it. We just put it on. And then Hillary suggested doing a video um, and asking Christine Lavin to create the video because it's something that Christine does and does extremely well. So um, well, it's a very it's a mo very moving video, and I encourage all the listeners to uh, click on the link on this site or or find it on YouTube. Um, yeah, it's it's a it's a very moving, powerful uh, video of of images. It's mostly just still images that are that are uh, panned and scanned, so to speak. Um, but it's very powerful, so I, I encourage people to look it up. All right, so once you had the lyrics in hand, I know Michelle, it, ch it changes for you song by song as to how difficult songs are to to get into one way or another. But in this case, it was easy. This this one just you know it flowed through me the way it flowed through Hillary. There was something in it. I mean, first of all, she wrote this a perfect lyric. It's a gorgeous. Lyric. Um, we changed really one one line in it at Christine's uh, suggestion, and I probably was a good suggestion, although I, I really, I thought the original line was very hip and really Dylan-esque. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, we love the original line too. Someday there will be the, <laughs> the, 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 the uh, bonus track. <laughs> the, I call it the director's cut, but there's no director. It's, it's, right. the, it's the composer's yeah, cut. It, and I don't know that it's, I mean, I feel that for where we've purposed the song right now, the rewrite serves that purpose. The original would not have served it the same way. But, um, but it was very cool. It was very cool. <laughs> but, you know, when, when somebody really understands song form and they have genuine content in that, it, it makes it a lot easier to write the music. And so, and so was it an afternoon? Was it uh, a couple of days? How long did it no, take? No, I think it was an hour and a half. An hour and a half. It just came. I mean, to, to, you know, to sketch it out. Right. After sure. that, then, you know, I, I, I um, write yeah, with my keyboard and computer and uh, then I started working on the it was a, I started it as a sampled guitar part and then I added a piano and I added a bass um, and that that takes more time you was know, this did you use that in the actual recording or did you oh, go yeah you're hearing it when you hear the recording and then my dear and brilliant friend I've been recording and producing with the same genius for 25 years his name is Stefan Oberhoff and he's worked with me on every, you know, both albums that I've made and a bunch of albums that we've produced for other artists and every song that I do for Universal. And I've done like 20 animated features for them now. So he's worked with me on everything. So you only had to rework one line and that was based on a suggestion from Christine. That's right. And otherwise it is what, what Hillary handed to you. It is. That, that's pretty awesome because that's yeah. not... And that doesn't happen every time, does it? Nope. <laughs> I have the original, you know, print out here, and I'd have to. We might have changed an and or a but or an if or a, one syllable somewhere, but that was it. Oh, and then I sent Hillary the music, and she had she had some thoughts about the melody and and suggested a change, and I made the change and sent it to her, and she said, "No, it was better the first time." It's <laughs> as if the song spun through us both. Um, and then, and then Christine was the one who said, this has to be sung by Maud Maggart. No one else should sing this, just Maud. Wow. That, and, um, we so, had, so, so that decision was right off the, out of the gate. Out of the gate. And well, she, it wasn't out of the gate when we wrote it, because we, I, who knew where we were going to go with any of it, but sure. as soon as it became a project, it was apparent that, first of all, Maud is just a glorious singer. And that so is true. I, in my opinion, anything I write should be sung by Maud, period. Yeah, and, <laughs> and we, had, we had performed together for the first time in New York, just in October, Maud and I, and I just mm -hmm. thought, oh my God, I love, not only, I love her singing, I love her. <laughs> I do. So, so, all right, so we're, feelings we're, we're, mutual. We're, we're, <laughs> that one was like, oh, okay, fine. But, fine. We're, but we're, especially this song, if I can just add to it, because I feel like Maud does, she could sing anything, you know, they say the, the real singers could sing the phone book. Sing the phone you know? book, sure. Yeah. All right, so, but, so, so Maude, you, you, they contacted you, yes? They, somebody said? Yeah. Who, who, well, who, yeah, who? because, well, I didn't know that they were writing a song, so <laughs> they let me know that they'd written this song. And, right, and, um, and you I obviously think, listened to it, and what was your first impression? I loved it, and I really, um, 
I was moved by the first line because it's so unusual to begin, um, I guess, it's kind of like a pop song, I guess, but begin a kind of a poppy song with the, with the words, a poet. <laughs> so unusual. That's unusual. Um, and uh, no, of course I loved it. I mean, I think everybody who hears it loves it. It's one of those magical creations. And I did think that, um, that I would do a good job with it. I mean, if I had loved the song and thought, you know, but it's not, I wouldn't, I'm not the right person for it, then right. I would have declined for that reason. But I thought, no, this, I, I can do this. Y your voice oh. reminds me a little bit of Vera Lynn, if you know who I'm talking about. Oh, really? That's yes. a compliment. Wow. Um, yeah, she, your voice definitely, I thought, this sounds like somebody. And then I had to think and I went, oh, it's like Vera Lynn. And, and so this the lyric. White Cliffs of Dover. Absolutely. Oh. <laughs> Till we meet again. Oh God, that's so beautiful. Yeah. We'll meet again. Um, uh, that so, makes me cry. Just the yeah. name of the song makes me cry. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So uh, um, I, I think your voice is actually perfectly melded to this particular piece of music and lyrics. No question about it. It's, you know, it's, it's not, it's not uh, out of your range in any way, shape or form. It's right in the pocket of what you do. So I, I think you're a very wise choice. It, it is in the pocket of what I do, but in a different way, because it is like, it's a folk song. Right. Yes. Um, rather than pop song, it's a folk song. And so um, I, I'm more closely associated with uh, early American songbook material. And a lot of people liken my voice to, I, I love that you like it to Vera Lynn, but you know, like I get like Helen Morgan and sure. little tiny voiced people and stuff. But uh <laughs> But well, I love folk you music. You don't have a tiny voice. You're not a yeah. tiny voice. <laughs> well, I could say something, but then you'd have to cut it out. <laughs> <laughs> she, has, she has a voice. Because that... it's, it's gonna name a name, but I won't do it. <laughs> what were you gonna say, Hillary? Oh, just, it's like spun glass. I mean, oh. that, and you know, so even though it, it's very well suited to those 20s and 30s songs that one is associated with and, and American, and songbook stuff, and very suited to this kind of folk a vibe, I think. It, and we haven't heard these kinds of folk vibe singers in a long time because the, the folk, the kind of Americana or, um, uh, you know, acoustic folk stuff I generally hear these days is a, just a different style. It's kind of um, throatier. I haven't, and there's something, this is, I hearken back to, um, the a string band, um, what was what were they called? The amazing. You're talking about the jug band with Maria. No, oh, yeah, the yeah. well, I can't think of the name of them. But these, the, the, a lot of the folk stuff in er, the '60s, which had more sort of, you know, um, Judy Collins and Joni Mitchell vocal styles, and Peter, not Peter Paul and Mary. Like that. Peter Paul and Mary. Yeah, I mean, not that she sounds like them, but that there's a that there's a sort of singerly um, beauty, simplicity, and 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 um, um, you know, influenced by the English and the Irish, that kind Absolutely. of um, vocal. This this song at this time to me feels like comfort food. Ah, it's not uh, it's not testing the envelope of my tolerance for something brand new. No, it's fitting into a. <laughs> beautiful pocket that just is like very comfortable and and new and beautiful but it's like comfort food to me it just sounds like something that makes me relaxed rather than i'm not being challenged by the song um in any you know harsh way and that i think is what's great about it um, okay so now i'm curious um when you're writing the song and then mod when you're singing the song do you write the song with a certain audience in mind? Do you sing the song with a certain audience in mind? Or are you just writing it to write it and sing it to sing it? The latter. That's Michelle saying the latter. the latter. It's just, you're just writing it to write it. I, you know, at least that's where we start. Um, yeah. and, and, then, and then every choice is what's right for this song. Mm -hmm. We write in a lot of different styles, um, but this particular song wrote itself through us and, you know, and dictated the other choices. It absolutely screamed at us, call Maud Maggart. 
And and when you set it down in the the arrangement that you made in the computer, you had an arrangement that would then fit naturally with mod. You didn't suddenly make screechy guitars out of it or something. Oh no, no, no. That's no, what no. I'm saying. Yeah. So, so you you arranged it in a way that that belonged in that pocket. I arranged it in a way that was appropriate to the song. Okay. Every song tells you what it needs, you know? I mean, they, there's, there's rhythm and there's nuance and there's color and texture and it, it, songs, songs make their own demands, each one. So but I, I, I have to say that's the genius of working with a, a composer who really understands lyrics. And I would hope a lyricist who really understands music is there's, there is, we have the same language um for st song form for song for the impact of the words for the way the words can be sung or not sung in the music um in fact we did have one word that i remember we talked about fate rather than lives and we just knew it wouldn't sing well we liked the word on paper but there are songs you know you also have to know our lives intertwined was our fates intertwined and we went no let's make it lives it'll sing better. i don't i don't remember fates yeah. Ever show and that never showed up in my on um, you never sent me that. Yeah, right, I did. It was in the so, first draft, but anyway. <laughs> so I'm curious, Maud, well, you've gotten the song in hand and you know you're gonna sing it. You've decided you're gonna sing it and you're you're happy to do so. Um, what are the first steps that you go through? How do you start to think your way into how you're going to sing? Key key is the first step because through the right key, then I can can um, use the nuances in uh, the in the range of my voice. To make uh, to make the words land and make them um, like my two favorite words in the song are um, kind and sorrow, mm -hmm. and I think those two words describe um, the feeling of the entire song pretty well. And um, so I wanted a key that w would allow me to express sorrow and kindness, and to really make that emotion those emotions come through. So the key is the is the first step, and then. Um, breaking down the lines uh, so that I un understand them really well. And they're very simple, but they're so beautiful um, so that I can tell the story. And that, that is, of course, really where, your, um, where your, your milieu is, is in terms of you're a storyteller more than just mm -hmm. a singer. You're, not, you know, you're, you're telling us a story. And that is what makes it so wonderful to listen to is because we then understand what the song means. Versus and then it makes it interesting and it make, makes it interesting to sing too. A absolutely. I mean, it draws you in <laughs> rather than you're just listening to a song. No, it actually draws you in. And I think that's what's, yeah. that's what's, that's what's really special about this particular um, recording. And, the, and lyricists, lyricists tend to like it when you do that too. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> I would think the composer does as well. <laughs> the composer does too. And I, I just want to add something is kind of like a little bit of a tangent, but this song is not about COVID-19. No, clearly not. It, it, you know, it's, it, it, is, it relates to this moment and it ties into it, but it is about nuclear threat. It's about global warming. One of my associations to the lyric that I shared with Hillary early on, do you remember the book On the Beach? Mm. Yes. And it ends, or if you've seen the movie with Gregory Peck and Ava Gardner, it ends with this banner flapping in, in Australia, which is like the last place that people were still surviving. Right, after, right, right. And the banner says, there is still time, brother. Mm. <laughs> wow. I and, didn't realize that. Yeah. And um, so, so this song has a lot of different levels, I think, of importance lyrically. I think that it's speaking to us in a lot of ways. And um, after, after hopefully this particular crisis has come and gone, this song will still be relevant. It's, it, it will, you know, it's gonna carry forward a lot of resonance. Well, this song is, um, you know, while there is still time could apply to so many different things. You, you okay. just hit it at a specific special time, but yeah, you could use this song in a in myriad different ways. Yeah. yeah I mean, and it this, would work. It would work in a movie. It would work on a TV show. It would work in a play. It would work all kinds of places. From your mouth to God's ears. I was just <laughs> going to say from your mouth to God's ears, but and also that um, you know, what has the pandemic really focused for all of us? I mean, there's always going to be 
not enough. Now, we always should be kind while there is still time. And time is the only thing we don't have, really. We have it and we don't have it. That coming up against that as a human being, you know, being aware of our mortality that separates us, you know, from cows and chickens probably is, is both a gift and a burden. And so, yeah. you know, that's just a spiritual truth for the human condition. And that's why it's such a pleasure to find a line from a poet and, and expand upon that, that really speaks to that because that's always the case. And it's what, what we have right now in this moment is a light shined on it. I'm not aware of any human who's ever been able to expand time out into infinity. Um, we all have a limit to how long we're going to be around as souls in this planet, unless you're, a, you know, unless you're a vampire, I guess. But, <laughs> or a believer in reincarnation. Well, the, but the, yet in this incarnation, you only have a limited amount of time. Then you can have multiple lives that can go on into infinity for sure, if you believe in in uh, Buddhism or various different um, right. reli religious thoughts. Or not necessarily spiritual thoughts, more than religious mm -hmm. sometimes. Um, uh, okay, so th th that's what I think I was going to ask. What ma what makes you think this song is special? And I think that's what makes the song special, is that it is it has this kind of unlimited um, feeling to it. Do you, do you agree with that? Absolutely. I mean, you know, it's hard to. I don't want to be the one to say it's timeless because I wrote it, and that's a little self serving, but. <laughs> You know, it, it. I write a lot. I write musical theater, as you do, Steve, and I write, um, uh, and as Michelle does as well. And I write other kinds of songs. I write in lots of different styles. I write comedy songs. You know, I write stuff that's very specific to the context, and but it's also a pleasure and a joy, and frankly, a a, a desire I've always had to also, you know, write something that isn't just contextually doesn't just live in the context that it's written for but has has its own sense of classicism or you know lasting outside of me in the context and it feels like this song is simple but is could have that same resonance the way those songs do so well, i agree with you i think the song is timeless there's nothing topical in it it doesn't, like Michelle says, it's not talking about it, the COVID pandemic, although it applies in terms of an emotion and an emotional resonance. So it's, it's, it is timeless in that way. It has a kind of, um, I don't know, Johnny Mercer-esque quality to it. Um, right. So I, uh, Also a compliment. Thank well, you. <laughs> you know, it, it is, it's, it's, it's just, you've done a beautiful job crafting it. And you know what, it, it shows, um, artists in maturity, not, not age wise, just the maturity of your, of your craft, because I don't think you would find too many 22 year olds would knock this out, you know, and especially not in a, in as timely a manner as you did. Um, so I want to talk about production a little bit because it must've been very unusual in this case to do production the way you did it, or am I wrong? You didn't go into a studio. No, no. you did everything from your homes. Right. And so. Uh, and Monty, masked. And mask. <laughs> no wonder yeah, why recorded, it has. The, I recorded the vocal with mask. <laughs> no wonder why it has that muffled quality. No, no. no, no. Okay. Um, uh, so do you have a studio in your home, Maud? Do you have a? How did you record it? No, um, my husband has a, a really high quality microphone, and um, we did it through GarageBand. And wow. um, we we <laughs> tried our best to keep our daughter. Our daughter was in the room with us. For, for some of the time and she was very good she was just listening and you know but um <laughs> but then uh, my husband took her away but yeah just a microphone and garage band and, and way, her really trying to keep a quiet talented songwriter say, yeah. say that again michelle her husband david lucky is a mm -hmm. very talented songwriter lovely man and a really good songwriter and performer yeah and, and, all right so so now michelle you you orchestrated arranged whatever is orchestrated and arranged in it yes well, I did the, those first three layers. Right. Then I sent it to Stefan. He added um, an actual acoustic guitar because mine's sampled, but we kept mine. It's, you know, it's the sort of spine of the accompaniment. Right. And then Stefan also added this marvelous sounding um, sample, pedal steel sound and, and beautifully too, just sort of wove in these textures. And then he also, um, 
he's just you know a brilliant mixing engineer and he uh he and i got we we did a remote session and um and ever so gently pitch corrected a note here and there of mods but, but mostly mod your pitch is so gorgeous i know <laughs> You can edit that out. So. <laughs> is, there, is there such a thing as a recording today that doesn't have some little pitch correction in it? Not that I'm aware of. And if um, there is, I probably don't want to hear it. We've, but but no, my no, pitch is but, here, but again, back to the proof of the pudding. Um, you can easily check out, listeners, you can easily check out not only Mod's recordings, but you can see her on YouTube plenty. And she doesn't have any pitch correction in front of a live audience. So yeah. it's, it's yeah. not a fake. It's the real deal. No. <laughs> but then, but the other thing is Stefan is, a, is brilliant at how do you treat a vocal? What kind of reverb do you use? What kind of EQ? What do you, how much compression do you use? So, so that, so that the vocal is, it's almost like he makes a halo around it. I don't mm. know how to explain what he does because I couldn't do it if my life depended on it. It's, but, it's it's not Phil Spector's wall of sound. It just has a way of being. No, it just it just and he just almost makes a space so that the vocal can shine in the center of everything, and so you can hear all the nuances that yes, I've for sure injected into it. You know, he lets you hear it beautifully, and he builds a mix that's always impeccable all right so i'm i'm curious is this what you're doing is this now common recording practice to be in separate locations and not even in any kind of studio quality room um and you're recording um st songs that can be put out into the world is that normal now it probably is but that's but amazing you know, some people are really really i mean listen stefan's i mean that's studio he's 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 worked with amazing artists um, a, a, over the years, Melissa Manchester and Brenda Russell and Jason Gould and uh, he's, you know, Burt Backrack and Tom Snow, he's, he's just a genius. And so he, he has a gorgeous studio. Did, once you had Maud's vocal, did that then require a different, did any changes happen after the vocal came in? No, just mixing, mixing, Michelle you know. Michelle confused. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm just trying to figure out what, what you would so need. In other, in other words, um, you you uh, lay down the tracks, you've got a piece of music, you didn't then change any of that later to accommodate anything that Maud sang. No. It we remained didn't what it was. Perfect. Well, that's, that's what I was asking, is if happen. anything adjusted once you received the vocal, because the vocal came in last, right? Before you mixed. Or did yeah. you add, or did you add instrumentation after Mod brought the vocal? Whether we added the, I think, steel after you did your vocal. You did your vocal just to my original synth tracks, right? Yes. Yeah. Oh, so, so I think the, you added a little after, yes, after the. Yeah. Vocal, I think. That's what I was curious about because I'm, I'm, I'm interested in this process. How does production work? How does a song wind up sounding the way it sounds? You have a certain sound to this song. You have a certain voice that's on this song. Um, clearly it could have gone in different directions if you'd wanted to, but you, this is how it worked out. This right. is, as you, as you say, Michelle, this is what the song wants. The song yeah. got, got what you, right. what did the song wanted? I think the trick in production always is to put exactly enough and no more. You know, it's, it's, it's like to know, you know when something's complete. And okay, so that's a, that's a really great artistic thing to say. How do you know that? What is it? It's just, just years of doing it. It just comes. Or how do you know? Gut. Gut. <laughs> Pure and gut. Sometimes, and sometimes you go beyond it and you go, mm, no, dial it back. Yeah. Sometimes feedback, you know, you try something and you think you like it. And then not too often because you're the ultimate creator of the piece but right. you know you also want it to be heard and you want people who hear it to get the most bang out of the buck of hearing it so there are very few people i would trust for feedback in the creative process but there are always a few mm -hmm. other artists she yeah. doesn't we're, we're different that way i don't I'm always different that way i'm very private when i'm in process and something i don't want anybody to hear it i i will trust my co-writer and i'll trust stefan and um, and if Maude had said, listen, could you please change? I would absolutely trust that too. 
but I'm very, uh, it's, it's a closed circle for me. For the record, Michelle and I have known each other our whole lives, um, literally. And as I've known you all these years, you're a very uh, confident person in what you do. Even if inside maybe you aren't, it's hard to tell sometimes, but you're pretty confident on the outside. I don't ever get a sense from you that you don't know what you're doing. <laughs> so I think that's indicative of what you're saying right now is that when you hear the song being worked on, you know what it is and what it wants and so on. I get a thing in my body and it's not just with my music. It's, it's like anything that I truly am listening to. I have a, a, a very powerful, like visceral reaction to it. I know when something is really grabbing me and I know when, when something goes by and I go, ouch, hmm. you know, I, 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 and, and so that comes into play even when I'm writing something really in, that's like this that came really fast mm -hmm. um I have a critic and she's nasty and <laughs> pitiless and um merciless she is Ming the merciless and she, she'll <laughs> let me know right away no not that no in, so so I'm, I'm curious for all three of you is have you ever experienced something where you went wait a minute I did that it sounded great at the time I'm going to change it now because it's not what I thought it was based on some kind of artistic distance all the time for me yeah <laughs> but Michelle I mean, no, uh, no. <laughs> it, I, I, I think once I hit gotten to a point with a song where it's kind of gelled in some way mm -hmm. i rarely will change it i've been pressured sometimes to change things and generally speaking and this sounds so arrogant and i promise you, i don't mean it to be but generally speaking the person will turn out around afterwards and say no never mind go back to where you were which i did on this song which i already did on this song and i mean and that's not always true. And, and, and certainly I do a lot of work for hire. I mean, all the work I do for Universal all these years since 1994 is work for hire and they'll ask for changes and I'll make them. Yeah. I, whether I think they're right or not. Did, did, did Maude, did, when, your, when your vocal was then um, melted to the song, did you, was there anything you wanted to go back and redo? Well, I was going to say, I, I feel that way uh, often that I want to go back and that's why performing is really difficult for me because I'll do shows and then I won't be able to sleep for a long time because I'll think, God, I made such a fool out of myself. Why did I do that? And I'm know, having but, a very hard time imagining that. Well, you <laughs> no, know, if that's the way it is. It's yeah. just, it's real, it's torture. I'm, I'm saying um, I'm having a hard time imagining you making a fool out of yourself. <laughs> I appreciate you saying that. <laughs> well, and maybe I haven't, but I tell myself that I have. But anyway, but in recording, it's different. And I, I am really, really proud of this song as, in its entirety. This was a really good job by everybody. This is, I wouldn't change a, a thing not a, about this. Except I, I do want to say something else um, about that, which is um, that I, I was so proud to be the one to um, sing this song, you know, first. But I hate it when singers say, that's my song, because songs are meant to be sung mm -hmm. and sung in a variety of different ways and by different people. So I hope that this song has a really beautiful, extended, long life um, with different colors of, of different voices. Indeed, um, indeed. Well, it is timeless in that way and can be sung by different people for different yeah. purposes. No you know, question. interestingly, we're, we're, we, I got a, 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 when it went out on the web, on Facebook and so forth, I got it was shared quite a bit and I got a um, note from somebody in Spain who asked me if they could have the lyric just to do a translation, not to sing a translation, but just to translate the word so that his friends who didn't speak English could understand the words. Mm -hmm. And I said, of course, you know, and I sent it to him and he wrote, sent me back a be beautiful Spanish translation. And we started thinking about it. And we're now talking about, we are in the process of having um, a wonderful, Spanish language singer songwriter do you know see if they can find a Spanish translation of the lyric that is also musical and works with the song I would love to have people you know people in because this is especially right now in this worldwide crisis wouldn't it be something to have this song in lots of different languages and oh, for sure 
you know, by different artists in different countries. And it just would go along with so much of this, the sense of what this is about and how we're together even while we're apart. I, I, I totally agree. Um, I, I think that this song has a universal appeal. That's the other part of it, is that it's not just specific to one thing or time. It has a universal sound to it. Again, going back to the classics, it's, a cla it's already a classic in my head. So, yeah. you know, there you go. <laughs> now, that's, that's from my mouth to the, to the listeners' ears, I can't. <laughs> Thank you, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we've, we've been talking for close to an hour, believe it or not. And um, is, there, is there any last thoughts you have on the future of the song or what you would like to see with it? Well, like, oh, go ahead. No, I was just gonna say, like I said, I would love to, you know, I'd love, I, it's getting out there. I, of course, and this is, yes, as a songwriter, of course, I wanted to quote unquote, go viral. I'm sorry for the pun, but, and get it out there and, get, and, oh, and have other artists record it and have, you know, everybody wants their babies to, to launch and thrive in Absolutely. the world. But this especially just feels, I don't worry about this one doing that. I feel like it's doing that. I feel like everything that mm -hmm. comes along, like this interview today, and we're meeting with the, we're having a Zoom meeting with the um, direct relief this afternoon. It feels like just the song has, as Christine Lavin, who did the video said, it has a life of its own. And we're allowing, I just want to um, give it, you know, as a mother, a chance to express that life of its own and grow. And it feels like it's doing that. So it's just exciting and kind of um, scary a little bit, just like a mother watching their child grow and go out into the world. But Well, you hope, it, grow, you hope it grows up and doesn't embarrass you in any way. Which exactly. Is right. you know? yeah. And takes care of you in its old age, your old age. <laughs> <laughs> Were you gonna uh, say, say something, Michelle? I was gonna say two things, one of which is, um, I, I really hope that it does a lot of good in terms of raising money for direct relief mm -hmm. and you know, purchasing protective equipment for people who need it. It so often we watch things unfold and we feel utterly helpless and like there's just nothing we can do. Um, and in this case, we're able to do something proactive and I, I hope that this song, you know, reaches more and more people so that this, that something can grow more. Mm -hmm. and, and the other thing is just this Im immense shout out to Christine Lavin because she jumped into this. She, I mean, you know, we, it took Hillary an hour and a half to write the words and took me an hour and a half to write the music. Christine spent hours on the video. She kept sending us drafts of it. She kept making it better. And she sent it out to people and she, you know, posted it on Facebook and she sent it to um, Gene, I, not, I always forget his last name, from the Washington Post so he could debut it on his mm, mm. blog post. She has been immensely generous and, um, and it's a lot because of her effort that this song's doing what it's doing. And um, it's so rare in the world for somebody to be that, kind and that giving of themselves. Well, and we're, we're in a time and age right now where a lot of people are doing that sort of thing, which is a wonderful thing to see happen because we've lived in a period where sometimes it isn't quite that way. Mm -hmm. and, and now it's really yeah. big time where people are giving of themselves. I think it's great. Maud, any last thoughts? Um, no, I just echo what, what, the, what the ladies just said. Yeah. I hope the song has a beautiful life and that, and that it continues to help. That, uh, that's really what makes me feel so good about this song is that it's helping. Yeah. Well, so I, I also hope that Maud gets to sing it in person live somewhere. Oh, for sure. That'll future. happen. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that, <laughs> we miss, I do miss the live performance. And I also sing and so does Michelle. So I totally relate to Maud's thing. You know, if I could sing one tenth as well as Rod does, I don't think I'd ever feel I was making a fool of myself or embarrassed. <laughs> but I know that all performers feel that. It's just, it's very exposing. Not you all. Go on stage <laughs> and you're just, you know, you're just a big open wound and um, potentially. And it's scary. And yet we do it anyway. And why? Because there's something about that live experience that is so incredible. And so, you know, I love this recording and I also just want to say, let's have a Let's look to a future where we have both 
live well, music. Well, for sure. I mean, we're, we're recording this podcast at the end of April of 2020. Um, who knows when we're going to get back to live rec- live performances again, because people coming together in a group like that is still a little scary until we probably have a vaccine yeah. or some instant cure. Um, that's for sure. Well, my great thanks today f- to Michelle Browerman, Hillary Rollins, and Maud Maggot for spending time with me on StoryBeat. As I mentioned at the top of the show, we're being graced with a great treat today. Michelle, Hillary, and Maud have been kind enough to allow us to end today's show with While There Is Still Time. Please make a point to visit directrelief.org and donate what you can to helping those on the front lines of the COVID-19 pandemic. You can also find the link to directrelief.org on this episode's Story Beat page. So now please sit back and enjoy this most beautiful song, While There Is Still Time. A poet of sorrow wrote three simple lines A plea that tomorrow may come to a heavy on all of our minds A poet is no one as most poets find But sister and brother take care with each other For we should be kind while there is still time There's rain and there's thunder before there is flood The signs and the wonders that warn of the spilling of blood And mountains will crumble, they're just rock and mud So sister and brother, take care with each other For we should be kind while there is still And so we've come to the end of today's Story Beat. If you like this podcast, please take a moment to give us a rating or review on whatever app or platform you're listening to. Your support helps us bring more great Story Beat episodes to you. Until next time, I'm Steve Cuden, and may all your stories be unforgettable.